And welcome again to Connors Talk. I am Russ Coleman. Joining me right now live is Emilio Danello, the Fulham Shadow, and Max Cohen. This is our post-match show of Fulham's 2-1 to loss to Aston Villa. And we're going to get through it in this probably next 45 minutes to an hour. I look forward to getting Emilio's view and Max's view. And uh, as always, if you're watching live, feel free to share a comment on the match and let us know what you think. And at the end, obviously, let us know who was your man of the match. I also had a very interesting poll. It's still open. Feel free to keep voting on that. I'm going to be mentioning that at the beginning of the show. Get your thoughts on that. But before I do anything else, I have to welcome back the guys. It's been a while since the three of us have done a show together. First, Mm. I'm going to Max. Mad Max or Optimus Max? I have a feeling it's Mad Max. <laughs> is it? Is it Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Fury Road? What is it? I don't know, Max. Are, are, are you Mad Max today? Oh yeah, we're we're on the Fury Road, Russ. Okay, um, we're on the Fury Road. Okay. All you have to do is look at that. I I don't even know what to describe the referee as, but the referee who happened to show up on Craven Cottage, I mean, he might have been just a bloke from the crowd, as far as, far as I know. Um, <laughs> okay. Ross, you could have done better. Amelia, you could have done better. Giannis could have done better. Mm. Our friend Steve Lillard definitely could. I mean, <laughs> it, it was almost amazing how bad he was. But that's all I'll say for now. Okay. We're going to get to that in just a bit. Mr. Danello, how are you doing? We just did a show a little while ago. How, how are you doing? And um, give me your opening thoughts from the match. Yeah, good to see you again, Max. It's been a while since we last did a show. Um, nice to see you again, Ross. We did that show last week. Um, look, I was there at the game yesterday. You know, we would. It depends which side. I'm, I'm, you know me. I'm very grounded, very realistic. I'm not biased towards Fulham one point, but I thought we deserved a point from that game yesterday. I don't think there was much between the two teams overall. I thought it was a sluggish first half, and I think Villa did enough to basically stifle the way we play. We were very tentative, very conservative that first half, and that's not the Marco Silva way. And we struggled. To, to do anything of note really in that first half. We sort of backward passes, sideways passing, Silver giving his players a kick up the backside with all his hand gestures on the touchline, I could see. But all credit to Villa for having a game plan that first half. And they they capitalised on a mistake that we made. But overall, I thought we were fairly even Stevens. Second half, yeah, again, you can't defend like, like unfortunately, a bottom three team. We defended at times really like a relegation team. But at the same time, we match Villa in that that's part of that second half. So to come away with a defeat is disappointing. Put the, we'll talk about the referee, no doubt, in a moment. But overall, yeah. there was nothing to suggest why Villa are good enough to be a top four team. I didn't see that on the pitch yesterday. I saw Fulham at times putting them under a lot of pressure with a bit more quality, a bit more composure. Probably would have got a point yesterday and are worthy of a point. But overall, disappointing to have lost. You can't put all the blame on the referee at the times. So I think at the end of the day, he was abysmal. Um, he needs to, you know, basically the Premier League have got to assess his performance on the pitch. That's not good enough. A standard you expect in this league, and um, but overall, there's there's a lot there's some positives here. Let's not let's not. I'm not going to be too oh, despondent. Absolutely. We played a team top four. I've seen a lot of criticism on, on 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 social media, but I don't think it was fully warranted. Other than you know two mistakes, we got punished, and that's what happened in this league. Because the bottom line, really, it's uh, you can't get away with that when you've got a proven striker like Villa have, and he's going to capitalise on any mistakes we made. We made two mistakes, two goals. Absolutely. I'm going to just share this comment from Stefan. We blame the ref, but we were worse than average. So again, we'll get to the ref, but I'm glad that Stefan gave kind of a a balanced view on that. All right. Before we get into my opening topic, I'm just going to share my thoughts on watching the match. And uh, Emilio, I agree with you. There's a lot of good things to take out of this. I want to say this. I I really agree with you on that. So for me, I think it's... uh, I think we should be looking at that as well as some good things to take out of it, okay? Two mistakes cost Fulham dearly. Let's just say it what it is. Defensive errors. Yeah. Fulham, are, as uh, our former manager would say, fine margins, right? Mr. Parker would say. <laughs> and unfortunately, with Fulham, oh, no. they are dealing with, especially when you're playing against a quality side like Aston Villa, fine margins. You can't be making these mm-hmm. errors. But my opening topic is going to be this, guys. And I actually did a poll, and it had almost 400 votes. Mm -hmm. And the poll was this. It was basically, do you hold Marco Silva partially responsible for the loss because of his decisions with the starting 11? So I'm going to go to you, Max, because I actually do. Because in my opinion, 
if you have these two players coming back from the African Cup of Nations, they've been playing regularly. You also have Tosin on the bench. And I'm thinking if he's on the bench, he can potentially start. I question the decisions not to start the two center backs that were on the bench. And then, of course, Alex Awobi. I think Fulham might have lost this match before it began because of these decisions. So I'll go to you first. What do you make of this? And I just want to mention that this poll that I did, almost 400 votes, and basically, yes was only a 40%. 60% said no. So most of the Fulham supporters in this poll say that these decisions, did they don't blame Marco for it. So I want to get your thoughts on this. I mean, Reem and Diop, they're, they're two tree trunks. They're ancient, slow, immobile out there. And as Amelia said, you can't give Ollie Watkins that kind of gift. Exactly. I, I, but I, I don't know. I don't want to be too critical, Russ. I don't know what the status of Bassi, Awobi, et cetera, mm-hmm. Tosin were, right? It, it is tough. Yes, they're playing games, but travel and all the stress and they're both exactly. terribly abused online. I mean, I don't know what their mental state was either. I, I can understand why he left them on the bench. I can understand mm-hmm. why. But what we can say is that Raymond Diop is not a good parent. I mean that's not a hot, that's not a hot take. I mean they were pretty they're pretty abysmal um, in the in the moments that mattered, right? I don't think they had terrible games, but as a defender, it, it reminded me of the 2017-18, like of 2018-19, like relegation season. It really did, Emilio. Just the yeah. way. I mean, mm-hmm. the first goal that is Robinson's fault, mm-hmm. plain and simple. Mm-hmm. To throw the ball in the middle is awful, idiotic. But once it gets there, you expect your center backs to defend. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't know what I would describe what they were doing as defending. It was almost like watching guard like they just watched there and, and Diop was more worried of putting his hands yeah. up and trying to stop the shot um and the second goal I mean that's incredibly easy to cut through us like that incredibly easy Diop's halfway at the pitch it's not a good pairing so I think it's clear but everyone can see that they cost us the goals in some ways but that's kind of where I'm going I, I don't know whether that's all Marco's fault you know what I mean okay mm-hmm. okay Emilio I want to get your thoughts on this because when I did my preview, I mentioned that I thought that Marco would go with this exact lineup, which he did. This mm-hmm. is the lineup he went with. I said I would have played if ready to go, Tosin and Bassett together, because that's your best pairing. In my opinion, your best pairing as center backs. I would have played a Wobi to give you that threat with William on one side and a Wobi on the other. I think you're going to be dangerous, and I think it's going to affect mm-hmm. Aston Villa. He went with the team that beat Bournemouth and a Fulham supporter said to me, this is not Bournemouth you're playing. You have to play a stronger side. So for me, I thought Marco did the safe move by going with the starting 11 from the Bournemouth match instead of taking a little bit of a risk, maybe ruffling some feathers and making some changes. Now, as Max said, fair point. I don't know the health of the players coming back from the African Cup of Nations or Tosin, but I'm going with the idea that if they can play and they're on the bench that they can play. Can they play 90 minutes? That's questionable. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But I was, again, disappointed by the starting 11. I think it was a factor. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, look, I, I I voted. I voted that it. I had agreed with the starting 11. It's, hindsight's it's a luxury. You know, you can always reflect okay. that. Actually, could have done X, Y, and Z. I think he got the lineup right. And people may okay. disagree with me. I think you've, you've had two players come from a big tournament, emotional tournament, a lot of matches, a lot of, uh, lot of 90 game minutes, you know, so as far as I'm concerned with all that emotion, you know, but, you know, I, it was the right thing to put them on the bench, ease them back in. Tosin picked up a, a knock a couple of weeks ago. I think he was there. If he was good, if he was fit, he would have started. The fact that he didn't start to me suggests <laughs> he's there as a backup. If there was an injury to your, your either back well, Bassi was obviously on the bench. He was just our last resort Tosin in the event there was any other injury. So, I agree with you. If they were fit, they would have started. But as far as I'm concerned, Bassi and were be still, long, like Max said, long journey back home, emotional tournament. Unfortunately, they didn't take the trophy home with them. But overall, they had a pretty good tournament, the pair of them. So I think it was right just to phase them. And you'll see, you will see the change next week against Man United, clearly, whether we've sure. won yesterday or not. I think they've, they've, they've got some game time now. They'll probably automatically slot into the starting 11. But I don't think I'm blaming Marco here, to be honest with you. You still expect a ream. And D- Diop to be able to defend more cover. Then again, we had a very good game against Bournemouth. I thought Bournemouth gave us more problems last week than the Villa. Let's be very frank. All those corners, one after the other, one after the other. 
we defended admirably. And Reem was a colossal man in defence last week, clearing all those headers. And Diop was protecting him as well. So, you know, if anything, if I look head to head, who gave us more problems? Villa were more clinical. Right. Almost gave us more problems. I was more nervous for 90 minutes last week than I was 90 minutes yesterday. Interesting. Yeah, on a, uh, mid-table, I like guess. Different type of game yesterday. Villa, more organised, compact, playing on the break, capitalised on errors. But they also had the game plan, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show. They kept us back, didn't allow us to play with freedom, didn't allow us to play that high press. Why did? Why were we sluggish first half? Because of Villa's tactics, and we just weren't able to break them down. So I don't think the starting eleven is a problem. I just think you make mistakes at whatever level, you're going to be punished. And that's what we did. Bournemouth didn't punish us last week. Villa did today or yesterday. Okay, very interesting. I'm going to share some comments. This is... From our friend Stefan Bassi and Awobi were only back on Monday, have not been with the team for a while. So that goes to your point, Emilio, and also mm. Max, Black, White, and Fred Markle almost always backs a starting a winning starting eleven. Hence, no changes. That's true as well. So I, I'm getting these comments. Raymond uh, Jeffrey says uh, Bassi and Tosin best pairing, mm-hmm. but he won't sign a contract. Does he deserve? To start toast, an interesting question. Over to you, Max. I say yes, because I think you should put out your best starting 11. What are your thoughts? I can see both sides, but I'm with mm-hmm. you, Russ. He's on the team. If you use that um, justification, why is he in the squad? Why not just mm-hmm. send him to the to the U23s? I mean, he has yeah. in the team for a reason. I think he's showing disrespect to the club, quite frankly. But the state we're in, we need our best players in the pitch. Um, and it is a bit desperate to play someone who's made so clear they don't value Fulham. I think Tosin will go down as a selfish player who I think his next move, he, it won't turn out well for him because he thinks he's better than he is. But he's still, I'd say, in the top two center backs we have at our club and he should be on the pitch. Okay. How about you, Emilio? Yeah, he's, he's, he's paying a wage whether he wants to stay at the club or not. So you earn, <laughs> your, you earn your wages, right? So if he's your best player. But look, this is a player who I remember last season when he played, made a few mistakes. And he was getting... Fans will criticise and applaud when things go wrong and when things go well. Two months ago, Rodrigo Gomunes, get out of the club. You're an absolute pile of crap. <laughs> Not good enough to even start, let alone now. Suddenly, he's a blessing slim sliced bread. So like you've got to be that. level-headed here. When We're going to talk about him, by the way. It's, We're going to talk no, about look, him. Look, it's the same thing. I said it to you the other day. Why does Robinson divide opinion? We're, there's going to be a, there's a lot of criticism. Robinson, what the hell was he doing? But <laughs> let's look at independent his stats this season. And I was asked a question the other day: Who's Fulham's player of the season so far? You know, you're thinking Paulinho. Yes, not not the levels he was last week, but but someone told me, well, Robinson's been fairly consistent all season. Look at those interception stats. So no, he's got he's improved as a player. But why does he divide opinion? Diop, when he makes a mistake, he's all over social media. When other players make mistakes, less criticism. So, again, it's biased towards Fulham. I'm saying, I'm just saying it from my perspective. I hear a lot of – I'm in the stadium. I hear the shouts. I hear the boos. And certain players, whether you're making mistakes or not, some will get more boos than others. And you even say when the players are announced at the beginning of the game, when you know, I'm there at the stadium, some get louder cheers than others, whether you're making mistakes or not. So there's a lot of bias – lot of opinion, but sorry, you know, Tosin last year, nobody wanted him. Now, Sonny's had a good run of games. We all think he's the best thing to slice bread. Mooney's the same. We've got to be, let's support our players through thick and thin, through good and bad. Stop bloody pissing the fat players off by being very biased. Sorry, I'm swearing, but That's you're okay. in the stadium, you're hearing all the noise, you're hearing all the criticism, and I just feel at times, certain players who make mistakes get so many, so get more criticism than that warranted. Palina made a lot of men mistakes recently. Have you heard have you heard much criticism of him? No, because of who he is, the player he is, the stature he is, the value is. We've got to just be a little bit more grounded here, guys. And I just find sometimes the fans can be a little bit overcritical on certain types of players. That's my rant for the day anyway. Okay. Okay. By the way, our friend Black, White, and Fred's Muniz is better than sliced bread. I love that. That was Did great. you say that two months ago, Black, White and Fred? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Did you say that two months ago, or suddenly he's got a, got a rich reign of form? I'm just saying, be it's, a, it's an honest question. Answer my yeah. question. What did you say two months ago when we had no strikers? Okay, I want to answer one more uh, question from the supporters here. And again, this is an interesting one. So this goes back to our friend Stefan. Over to you, Max. When Wilson and Awobi are available, BDR should be on the bench. Yeah. I would agree with that. Would you agree with that, Max? Yes. Okay, how about Easy. you, Emilio? 
No, absolutely. And I th- look, I'd, two years ago when we got promoted, I always said the certain players are not good enough to play at this level. And I actually put my hand up and said, Bobby is a good squad player. I wouldn't play him week in, week out. But is he still top scorer of the season for the club? Is He, he still I has a he match. I wouldn't play him every week. He's clearly not good enough. But he gives you what Marco likes about him is his versatility, his commitment. He gets in the right place at the right time. He's got a few assists. He's got in the goals. He's an important squad player, a likable person. And he's an important squad player for the team. I wouldn't play him week in, week out. We've got better quality there. But I saw again a lot of criticism when he extended his contract a few weeks ago. Thinking, let's not forget, this is a man who's your top scorer of the season. Now, Put that into perspective as well. So I like Bobby because I know he can, but I wouldn't start him week in, week out. So I agree with Stefan there. Okay. One more question before we move on and talk about the rough, because I want Max to scratch that itch. Okay. I really do. So, but before we do, this is, I want to go over to you, Emilio. Andreas is over it now. Mm-hmm. I just want to just mention this. And I've said this to someone else. I think when he plays with Jimenez and Awobi, he turns out good performances, but when those guys are not there with him to do these triangles, I think he becomes a passenger, Emilio. Mm-hmm. I think he needs the perfect situation. No. I think he's been a passenger many, many times this season. What are your thoughts about Andreas here? Yeah, I agree with Steve. You know, we often have this discussion offline and you know, during the games, and you know, just from set pieces as well. You know, the amount of corners we get at times, we're not with those those crosses and those those corners are not really hitting the mark often enough in the right area. So. If, at times he looks lost on that pitch. You know, he's, you know, yesterday, I think at times he worked defensively, he worked hard. He sort of, when the substitutes were made in the second half and we had a bit of a lift with that goal, I saw a different Pereira. He sort of, you know, he sort of got more stuck in, playing a little bit more advanced when we made those substitutions. But overall, not consistent enough, albeit he's got quite a few assists. But, you know, he's our resident corner taker. He would take penalties, I think, if, if, if we had a penalty these days. So for me, not not doing enough and a bit of a luxury play and we're, we're but you know it's good to have a score. We need someone like that as a squad player. You know, again, we're not blessed with depth in this squad, but right, he shouldn't be guaranteed a starting lineup. I don't think he's done enough this season to play week in week out and injuries, um, international tournaments for the African nations. It's you can see why he's got more game time than others. But in a normal season, I don't think he'd be playing week in week out. He hasn't warranted it. Okay, very good. All right, I just want to go over to to uh, Black, White, and Fred, who has answered you, Emilio. I did, to be fair, compared him to Mitro, and I was told I was mad. So that's his response to your mm-hmm. comment ab- about I, Looney's I, I, going I, back I, and I. forth. Okay. Back over to you, Max. Real quick on Andreas, and then we're going to talk about the ref. <clears throat> I agree with you completely, Russ and Emilio. I mean, you know, this is actually something my, my family talks about a lot. My dad is convinced Andreas is a fraud. Convinced. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all he does is whip in a set piece and offers mm-hmm. nothing on the pitch. And last season, I pushed back against him a lot. I was like, no, Andreas is key. I can't defend him anymore. Pereira has been, you know, just a, yeah. the passenger is the best way to describe him. Yeah. He doesn't influence the match, unfortunately. Nope. Um, and this is why he's at Fulham and didn't make it at United. Okay. But, Very I mean, good. That, that's something right. I want to say quickly. I'm about Go ahead. Just kind of Go ahead. Predict- I think this season has been a bit odd in the sense that we've had so many different fan moods. Right, mm. it's just feeling like a total roller coaster. Um, I think Emilio's point about the players is so true. Criticism warranted, sometimes not. Players have a good and bad season. As Fulham, we are a mid-table club, and that means we will win matches and lose matches yeah. basically at an equal rate and be extremely unpredictable and non-consistent. But we're still going to stay in the Premier League, and I think that's just like as a fan base. I think we need to talk about that more. Is that this is what being mid-table means? You don't win every match. You have frustrations. <laughs> Oftentimes, you might look outclassed but you're winning some match and that's what gets us why can't we play like that every week i mean that's just how it is being the table mm-hmm. and I, I think my expectations need to be reset you know we last season we got way too high thinking we could finish sixth seventh it's the premier league we're not at that level yet our squad's nowhere near it um and i just think that pff, I, more perspective is needed and i fall into this trap too yeah. um most recently i think the bournemouth away match i mean that was one of the worst 90 minutes football i've ever witnessed in person and the Mooney stuff was what well, I was saying the same thing. Mooney's is terrible. Get him out of the squad. And then look what he does two months later. And the same yeah. thing with Jimenez. The exact yeah. people were saying, and I was saying, put Vinicius in there. At least he yeah. scores. Yeah. And now Vinicius is off in Galatasaray and Jimenez is, oh, we need him back. So mm. things change. 
we're very reactive and, as, as people. Yeah, that's exactly. not, I think that's just how it's a great point. Yeah. yeah, it's a great point, Emilio. Do you want to share something? And I just want to say before you do that, our friend who is actually watching right now, Steve Reynolds, would have many conversations with me about Muniz, about Jimenez, and now look at how they have rebounded. Obviously, Jimenez got injured, but same thing. We react at the time, and we don't give the players, and just in general, a chance to uh, thrive. And in both cases, they have. Yeah, and I think, look, I, I don't boom my players. I never have done. At the end of the day, I'm one on the pitch. There's 11 players on there. You want your team to do well. Like Max says, we're you know we're you know, best at the moment, a mid-table team. We can maybe get top seven. Top. We've done that in the past. But they're, they're, we're going to you know win as many games as you lose. Like you said, Max is right. And so there's going to be highs and lows. And you know we're we're closing a gap against the, the bigger team, so to speak. I think we, we're more competitive against those teams. In the meantime, the teams around us are probably more more close to us than they were last season. I think last season we were beating the teams below us. This season, our points ratio against those teams is not as strong as it was a year ago. So look, it's some you win, some you lose. We are closing a gap against those bigger teams, and we are competitive. Like Arsenal, we beat Arsenal. A home drew with them away. We're losing by a narrow margin against the bigger teams. So we're closing that that gap. We've got to make sure that the teams below us, we, we, we're, if we're just as strong and beating those, getting four points out of six, then we'd be higher up in the team. Burnley's a good example. They've right. been lambasted. How many games have they lost at home all season? Or how many games have they won at home all season? But they've got to manage to get a draw against us. And we gave away two stupid goals in that game. So it's consistency is the name of the game. But look, Mark has done well to get the best out of this thin squad. We're mid-table at the moment. You know, I think that's the best we can hope for. There's a difficult run of games coming up, so we've got to make sure we just, just take, take some perspective here. But we've got a lot to look forward to. Players are back from injury. African Nations tournament's over and done with. You know, If we have our full-strength team out there with a strong squad, then we're going, to, we're going to pick up more points and we'll be fine. But it's all about next season now, as far as I'm concerned. Stay in this division, look forward, build on, and maybe the FFP stuff, all that goes behind us and we can actually start building and strengthening the squad. We need to. We can't keep an aging squad like we've got this season. It's not going to get us very far, but I support my players, whether they're doing well or not well, and I won't boo any player at my club. And, you know, I despair when I hear a lot of criticism, sometimes unnecessary towards certain players, just because they make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes at work. Max, I'm sure, does. You do as well, Russ. Of course. You're not going to be tried each and every time you make a mistake. You learn from it for next time, but it's just why certain players seem to be protected from criticism and others a fraction of a mistake it's all over social media okay excellent stuff okay max i'm going to give you your choice because we're going to do both of them which one do you want first the referee or rodrigo muniz oh let's let's talk about muniz let's you want to talk about muniz okay let's do muniz Um, first okay that's actually a good time to talk about rodrigo muniz i'll go to you first thoughts on the performance of Rodrigo Muniz. Now, what's interesting, and I talked to a foam supporter after the match and said, besides the goal, didn't do much. And I said, I watched the match, and I, I disagree with that. I thought he did a decent amount besides the goal. What are your thoughts? I actually tend to agree with, with, with that assessment. They didn't do very much. Okay. The goal. I mean, but that's not really the point is he's scoring. And he's scoring. I mean, that finish. I'm going to make a – I think that's goal of the season. I know it's a hot take and it's probably not true. Wow. To hmm. flick that from well, well beyond the far the near post to pass one of the best keepers in the world, Emmy Martinez, that was it, that was audacious. And it was so measured. And it was everything Muniz wasn't doing earlier this season in terms of just trying to hit as hard as he could, doing his best Darwin Nunez impression. And that was deft and that was just incredible skill. And I think his confidence is surging. He's he's someone who understands where to be. Um and, and I just wasn't seeing that earlier from him. I mean, he just seemed lost on the pitch, and now he has that sixth sense of nipping in and, and flicking it mm-hmm. on. There are times in the first half I think he had that you know volley which he just lashed into Rosette, and he needs to be more measured. But I actually, I like his work rate a lot, and you can see. I mean, he's so, still so young, and he's still so new to England, but I think he was excellent. Okay, very good. How about you, Emilio? You got a firsthand look at Rodrigo Muniz. Your thoughts? Yeah, like I said, it's if you look at how many touches he had the whole game, you could, if you just purely look at stats, you know, he didn't touch the ball much, but the few that he did touch, look, he, like I said, black and white and Fred just saying through ball to Adama, that's one touch. There's goal is a second touch. I know there was another one where, like Max said, he shooted it up into Rosette, but that that's confidence. That's arrogance. When you're starting to score goals and you have a bit of confidence on your shoulders and you believe in yourself, 
the fans are believing in you, your manager's believing in you, you, you could afford to do that sometimes. Andreas Pereira does that time and time out. There was a moment yesterday when I was actually effing and blinding, saying, come on, you're in a good position, Fulham, 1-0 down. What does he do? He does Mr. Selfish Andres Pereira. Sh took a shot from long range, went no in no man's land. When actually we're in a good position. Mooney, Mooney's can, sometimes can be afforded that luxury now because he scored, he scored what, 4-3 now? Got confidence. The way he scored that goal yesterday was, you know, was again a play with confidence. Two months ago, he would have been nowhere near that ball. But now he's believing. He, you know, he keeps keep chasing, keep believing. Defenders make mistakes. Fulham players make mistakes. So can Villa play. So again, he capitalised on a bit of uncertainty in that Villa defence. But an innocuous ball, let's be honest. Robinson cross wasn't very soft, wasn't going there. Villa sort of goalkeeper defender trying to protect it. But hesitancy, bang, you got your big man sort of creeping in and poking that ball in. And a month or two ago, that wouldn't have happened. Why? He's got that confidence, a renewed level of confidence. So, you know, there were moments when I thought he won. He won a couple of free kicks again because he, he chased balls down. He believed and had that strength and confidence. You know, maybe I would like to have seen our players target him a little bit more yesterday. I think he didn't, you know, didn't contribute much else other than that, albeit okay. he scored the goal and did a through ball too. But, but overall, you know, our players were on av were fairly average yesterday. And that's the key. That's the key thing. I think overall there were moments when we played particularly well the last twenty five minutes. But Muniz is, you know, we'll talk about man of the match afterwards. But overall, yep. this is a player who's got whose confidence is sky high now. Long may it continue, but you know, let's see. It's three games. You know, we've got a tough run. Let's see what he could do against Man United. I thought Man United game at home, let's not forget Craven Cottage back in November. I thought he had a good half, and then he got injured, didn't he? And then we saw him out of the game for, what, another four to six weeks. That's when Jimenez came in, and suddenly he found a rich vein on form and started scoring goals. So, look, like Max said, the tide keeps changing. Some, you know, some moments you take, you capitalise on your opportunities. But, uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Black, Black White Fred, that's right. We, I expected a bit more service to Muniz with a few touches he had. He didn't really get much of the ball, but... How old is he? 22? He's 22 he's years old. 22. So he's got a good manager there. He's going to keep coaching him. And who's believed in him in all this time. Let's be honest. He's believed in Rodrigo Muniz. And hopefully now he's seeing the fruits of all that coaching and labor. Okay. Very good. I just want to mention, because we're going to talk about the ref now, that mm. he would have caused another corner, but the referee made the wrong decision. So let's get to it. Because again, if you see the replay, and I've seen the replay, it's, Obvious. It's obvious it should have been a foam corner, but it was a goal kick. Just a terrible decision. So, Max, you were just uh, messaging me and Giannis about this, that you wanted to talk about this. Giannis, unfortunately, could not join us today. But you did have some uh, things you wanted to say. So let's talk about the referee. I do want to mention this to both of you. I find this curious that this is the third match that Fulham have had a first-time ref this season. What is that about? What is going on here that this is the third match that they are debuting a referee with Fulham playing? It, it, it's a complete lack of respect, Russ. They see Fulham as a nice club. Oh, he's a new ref. Oh, he might, he, oh, he coached a couple of Sunday league games. We're giving him a promotion. Yeah, let's send him to the cottage because they won't be upset at him. And, and here's the best part about Saturday, right, Russ? And yep. Is that they did that again. They said, where do we send the newest, most junior ref who we know is going to have a shit game. We send to the cottage because it's nice, because it's quiet, because he won't hear any abuse from the fans when he makes a bad call. And he was so scared of the nice, quiet Fulham fans that he blew the whistle as soon as 95 minutes went. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how much he messed up. They sent him to the nicest, most pleasant atmosphere, and he was so scared he couldn't play any extra time. That, that that's what explained to me. That was hilarious. He had the worst. I mean, not not the worst game ref I saw, but it was close. And mm -hmm. I, I, no one can justify. No one can okay. justify how the ball is in for fifty seven seconds in extra time. There are substitutions. There are injuries. There are stoppages in play. And he blew at ninety five thirty. In in the okay. season when we've played games that go to hundred minutes. I mean, I know. they're telling the refs, mm -hmm. well, you know, oh, that's sorry. He probably wasn't in that briefing. He was probably still at secondary school or whatever. He probably missed the briefing. Okay, we're actually going to try to play matches longer this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he lost control. And no one respected him. That's the worst part. Is no player on the pitch except maybe John McGinn, who was actually refing the match, actually <laughs> respected him. I, mean, I mean, the yellows he gave out were a joke. He gave a booking to Adama Traore because Adama Traore is a big guy. Is that really how football works? Because some dude ran into him and bounced off him? Uh, yeah, sorry. I, that, that's, that's my rant over with Russ. That's okay. I'm going to go to Amelia, but I want to share this comment. Over to you, Emilio, because I think this is 
what it's about. Mm -hmm. Stefan says, I think we come across as pushover as fans. And I think that is something that the FA, the Premier League, look at. They're like, well, listen, we're just going to send them to Fulham. And I agree with Mm -hmm. Max. I think it's a lack of respect, Emilio. Mm -hmm. But I want to get your thoughts on the decisions Mm -hmm. and also why we are getting these first-time refs third time. Yeah, I think they always, I think, they, you know, looking at neutral, why would they have chosen this match? They probably would have chosen this match. There's there's no rivalry between the two teams. Their history is, is normally they're always quite a, so how would you say it's, there's never any bad rivalry or any bad feelings between these. So there was a, obviously the 2018 final. Aside from that, Fulham Villa games have always been quite passive, quite mellow, well, good entertaining games over the years. So maybe there's an element of that. Small, let's say, small ground. You know, not not a tense atmosphere. They they won't they won't put it into a into an into a match where there's Brighton and Crystal Palace, where there's strong rivalry between the two West Brom and Wolves, for example. They're that type of hatred between the fans. So, there, is it about lack of respect or more? How can you integrate a, a, a potential future manager into a match where there's less tension, less rivalry, good brand of football, and it gives him a, you know? I think that's part of the reason why when they select Fulham and. Maybe that's a that's a compliment. The fact they think we're we're we've got a set of fans who are normally quite quiet, not the loudest fans in the world. But yes, they believe you me, the fans were very very vocal, especially in that second half. You know, literally the amount of time wasting, the antics at Villa were playing, and we've done it ourselves. Brighton away last season springs to mind. You know, we've we've been on the flip side where we've time wasted, right. we've tried to run the game down. You know, cause a bit of controversy, and we nicked a win uh, with Salomon. Was it a, a year to the weekend that he scored that winner away to Brighton? So. It works both ways, but some of the decisions, first time I look at the first half, off the ball incidents, off the ball fouls, linesman not not flagging for any any foul, the referee in no man's land, booking the person when they do the third foul, not the first or the second. You gave you set a precedence, you're not you're not booking their keeper at all for time wasting throughout the game. What does that tell you? You know, you've you know, book him early in that second half, it'll be a different story for the remaining 40, 45 minutes. But no. No, you let them get away with murder, and then you continue to let them get away with murder. You, you're clearly, you know, you're out of, you know, you need to be more ruthless. You have the opportunity to be more ruthless, more decisive, more assertive, and failed to do so. And like Max said, I think it was only less than a minute of actual playing in that in those five minutes of added time. Referee should have given us another two or three minutes to play. It may not have made a difference, but it's just a principle here. And, but we had 90 minutes previously to, to to get something out of the game rather than relying on added time. But overall. He wasn't in control of the game. How many yellow cards did we get in the last five minutes? I think we had yeah. about five yellow cards. And again, they should have been more consistent. I can remember the, their, their, their wide man, I can't remember his name, the number 15, did a you know a foul, should have got a yellow card, a cynical foul, did a step in your hands and type of foul, didn't get carded. Two fouls later, got a yellow card. But you know, again, be assertive, decisive, put that yellow card out. He tried to let the game flow, but he missed a lot of off-the-ball fouls and tackles. And I think that's where... Uh, we're seeing forget the bit, the bit at the end throughout the 90 minutes i don't think he was in control of the game and you know it was one of the worst refereeing performances i can remember in living memory but you know you know unfortunately it's happened to us but we had chances let's not be let's be realistic we had chances to get that equalizer is that the referee's fault or is that just bad finishing from us so again let's get the, some perspective here as well but, but when you take away four minutes of time that's lawfully yeah. allowed for us to play yeah. i mean i i think we could have had an equalizer the way the mm, match was right. going I mean, the momentum yeah. was so clearly towards Fulham. You're right, Trier should have scored yeah. when he was put through. He should have scored, Trier should have scored. I mean, Iwobi had a great shot. I mean, we were building and building and building. And to cut us off for, I mean, no one can explain that, right? I mean, sometimes a penalty call, you can describe the other's point of view and you can say, okay, as fans, we can reasonably disagree. Mm-hmm. No one can agree with what he did. And that's what made me so upset, guys, is just that there is no, there's actually no explanation for blowing the whistle at 95 yeah, minutes. Yeah, there. exactly. There's, exactly. And it, that's, that's where the injustice comes from. It's yeah, you, and I, you and cannot, I agree with you. you in that respect, I agree. That. I certainly agree with you. And there were moments in that last 10 minutes, I think we lost our heads a little bit. And that's when the frustration has crept in. Paulinia, yeah. did he need to make that foul? No, it was only a matter of time he was going to pick up his 10th yellow anyway. Lukic. Lukic just Lukic, got Lukic, in. Come didn't... on, he barely come on the pitch. First tackle, yellow card. Right. That wasn't warranted. Whereas a Villa guy, number 15, it took him three fouls, three cynical fouls to get his yellow rather than his first one. So again, it's lack of consistency. But... I think we lost our heads out when we thought actually an equaliser is forthcoming. Adama had that moment, should have scored, in my opinion, right in front of me. But we lost our heads something. We gave away stupid fouls. That played into Villa's tactics. The referee then gave us yellow cards. We then became more frustrated and further yellow cards. We've just lost our heads. We had a bit more composure in that last 10 minutes. And 
to be honest, the referee's um, poor decision making and Villa's antics that that created the frustration in us. And I think actually we threw that opportunity away because we lost our heads in that. It's interesting. We lost our heads. Five yellow cards. We played right into the referee's hands and into Villa's antics. That's on us. That's on I, us. I'm we, glad that you to... said that, Emilio. Yeah. I'm sorry to break in. I just want to just share my thoughts on this because I see where Max is coming on and, and you. And I'm glad that you brought it more back to us. But And I want to give Villa a little bit of credit here. Time wasting everything. Team mm. does time wasting, and I just want to say that they took advantage of mm. the referee in the way it was being played. We say that in another sport over here play business, how business is being done. That's how mm. business was being done at Craven Cottage. So, Aston Villa, we're going to play as such. So, that's why I put some of this on foam, and I, I don't like blaming the ref for a loss. I, but I, to Max's credit. And yours, I think it's a factor, but I think more should be put on form. And I think, Amelia, you'll agree with me on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Look, it's we can blame the referee. You can't blame the referee for the two mistakes that led no. to their goals. And I think, with that, we lost our heads at the end there. I think we that exactly what Villa wanted. They wanted us to do that. We, we, exactly. Carlina's frustrations, unnecessary yellow card. He's out for next game. It was only going to be a matter of time, but he's got it now. We have to make do without him. Lukic barely comes on. Silly foul, not a yellow, but silly. And then that caused more frustration. We couldn't get the ball. Adama Traor, a couple of stupid free kicks he gave away in added time. Look, we're trying to get the momentum. All we keep doing is falling foul to their tactics. And they're basically trying to, basically trying to you know, con the referee to some extent. And that just kept slowing the game down. And then when you play, you're already time wasted for 45 minutes and you're feigning injury, this, that and the other. Again, that just played into their hands. But we've... We could have should have risen above that and and explore and be more assertive and stop falling foul of those those tactics. And look, we lost our heads. Why so why we got five yellow cards? Right. And Stefan really just nails it here. And we're talking about it. Villa took advantage of the lack of experience of a referee hmm. and our naivety. Yeah. And yeah. I agree with that. And I think that basically breaks it all down. Guys, one more topic before we analyze the match itself. And uh, Miller, you already brought us there, so let's go right back here. Let's talk about this. I'm mm. actually watching the Manchester United match in the background right in front of me. They're up 2-0, by the way, right now to Luton Town. Okay. So it didn't take long. We're only 12 minutes into that match, and they're already up two goals. Yeah. Wow. is out for two matches, Max. <laughs> we knew eventually this is going to happen. Let's talk about what this means for Fulham. I think this is obviously mm. – uh, a big deal because Fulham have never played well without him. I think that they've survived without him, but let's talk about Paulinha getting his uh, 10th yellow card. So he's out for two matches. This is the issue of Paulinha, right? Is that he doesn't temper himself ever. That's why we love him because he's absolutely rabid for 90 minutes, but th there's no composure and he didn't have to make that tackle. It was silly. And you're mm -hmm. right. It's United away. On the form they're in, I don't want to play there. Brighton home next week. They just won 5 0 today away from home. I mean, these are tough matches. Next match after this Wolves away. They're on red hot form. And then Spurs home. These are not matches you want your best players out for. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only two matches, sure, but it was silly. My question is I don't actually know the rule. Was he going to get a two match suspension anyway? Or if he, if it elapsed a certain, because he was going to get a yellow up to now and then. So maybe he wanted to do it tactically to play matches that maybe weren't that winnable i have mm. no idea but the the, the 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 main point is the same he gets too many bookings and that's maybe why he's not why he's at fulham you know i mean he wants to go to Bayern, obviously but he's <laughs> top players can control themselves better mm. and aren't as naive i guess jumping in like that every single yeah. match okay over to you uh, emilio your thoughts and uh, i want to share this comment from steve reynolds now's the time to look at a squad without Zhao. I think, you know, I, was, I think it's inevitable. You know, I think, I think he will go in the summer. Um, unless, we, if we if we can strengthen that squad, build on where we finish off this season, then who's to say he can't stay at the club? You know, he's 28, 29. Bayern clearly missed that a type of player. But then is 29, 30 the wrong age for Bayern Munich to invest in a player of 70, 80 million pounds? I don't know. I don't think it's a done deal he'll go in the summer. You know, I think okay. it's, it's, it's still... A high probability he will leave, but 
Marco Silva wouldn't have committed to this long long term of this club unless he knew the reasons why there's been lack of investment. I think there's more to it than we think. It's okay. easy to blame the cards for right. investment, but why did Marco Silva sign a contract? Clearly, he felt there's some. He's got some confidence in his squad. He believes in the owners and thinks he can get Fulham to the next level that we're all all hoping for. But you know, we're missing him in two key games in a weird way. We, do we want him to miss these two games rather than miss more winnable games, potentially? Never a good game. We, we always want your best players on there, but it was only sure. a matter of time. You know, Tottenham at home, I think they're not in the greatest run of form. I think we can get something out of that. And Wolves away, we're probably going to need him there. Man United away with him or without him. With him last season, we didn't win those games. We haven't won with him this season either. So it's my point is, if you're going to lose him, lose him in maybe games where that you're less likely to win and keep him in the games that you're more you're more likely to to win. So it's it's but we do miss him when he's not there. Yesterday, second half, he was he was immense. Just his body language, chasing balls down, winning balls. There was one moment right in front of me. He he went for a ball, just got a slight deflection off him. He went for a throw to uh, to Villa. Just the frustrations, his body language, his face. I said it all. I think that, I wish I'd taken the photo off quick enough to to send it to you guys. But that's what I love about him. You know, his passion. But on another day, I haven't seen any of the replays. I haven't seen any any. But I saw that foul yesterday from a distance. It looked quite cynical. I don't know if it was as bad as it looked from the stands, but like I said, I haven't seen the replay. But people are saying to me that could have been worse than a yellow. But I don't know if, what what how bad was it? So I haven't seen the replays. Was it was it as bad as it looked? Or was it a soft yellow? What are your thoughts, Max? Clear booking. Clear booking. I more mean, than a yellow? He, he, Would it be more than a yellow? No, it wasn't from a sending off. It wasn't a sending off. No, I didn't yeah. see it because it was quite distant from me. I don't really look quite cynical, just the way the Villa player rolled over the pitch. I mean, he, he just came with such force because he's such a big boy. Yeah, that's just who he is. I mean, but, okay. I mean, listen to this. Jao Polina's 10 yellow cards, as we all know. That's the most of any other player in the league. <laughs> and uh, I just shared this comment. Guys, you can't stop pulling his aggression or style play. If you do, you stop the man. What are your thoughts about that, Max? Yes, I agree instinctively. But also, if you want to take your game to the next level, you have to just, I don't know, be smarter. It's, it's, it's easy for us to say here, but I know. like, just be more situation dependent. You can, you can foul players, but no, no one says don't foul. But that wasn't a, he didn't need to do that. Yeah, and how many of those? That's the only thing. This season, I think... How many of those 10 were in needless situation? Needless. It doesn't, it doesn't help himself sometimes. The refs are already inclined. It's like a Mitro factor, right? Refs mm-hmm. are already super in tune to Mitro's antics, so they'd be more likely to book him. And the same with Paulina. They know he likes a hard tackle, and he just he plays into that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good stuff, guys. All right. Coming up next, we're going to break down the match, and we're going to end with Man of the Match. Okay, guys. Let's get to it. I'll go to you first, Emilio. I want to get just your opening thoughts, your analysis of the first half, and then we'll talk about the goal. Actually, you know what? Let's just talk about the goal. And I have compared this, and I think Max will understand it's in American sports in the NFL. If a quarterback is thrown against his body, it Mm -hmm. tends to be intercepted. When you do what Robinson did, I think you're setting yourself up for this situation. So just give me your thoughts on the Aston Villa goal here. Because up until that point, you were there. It was probably pretty even. I mean, how much did Aston Villa really offer? I think they, they've had, obviously, a few opportunities. But what are your thoughts about how this all went down? Uh, I, I attribute it more to the fact of the Villa tactics. They, they stifled us at the beginning of the show. They, inlaid, they, they, they basically forced us back. We had no opportunity. We didn't press in that first half. They were trying to, you know, they always had, two men on, on some of our key players. So we never really had a chance to play with any sort of fluidity, move, lack of movement. That's because of Villa's tactics. They pushed us back and we were literally go sideways, backwards, sideways, backwards. And I think that was a consequence. Robinson had the, taken the, the throne right in front of me. There was no there was no urgency with the Fulham players. Come to the ball. Someone come to him. Get the ball, get the throw in. But the, our players were static. And that was a, that was a kind of... So, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a careless throw in. We obviously threw... Hospital throw in to uh, to William didn't get to the ball first. Watkins still had a lot to do. We were again probably too slow in responding back to that, but he still had a lot to do and scored quite comfortably. But my point is, Villa's tactics, you know, basically got the better of us in that first half. We were just very tentative, very slow, lethargic. We just couldn't play our, our style of football, and that's that's their tactics. They you know, 
what's his in the villa manager got one on marco silva yesterday as far as i'm concerned because okay if there was more urgency more you know there was more design more 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 movement robertson would have had to it was literally a moment who am i going to throw to looking left looking right looking forwards come on for them players come to him come and get the ball come and there was no urgency there and that's because of villa's tactics stifling us and that's why that game was a little bit sort of nip and tuck in that first half because villa know how we play we like to play with the high press with that urgency and to be honest, it was a very much it had nil nil written all over in that first half, weirdly, because it just was who's going to make the first mistake, who's going to who's going to be punished for a, a moment of error, and that's exactly what happened. That's but very that's, interesting. That's, that's the way Villa really set themselves set themselves up. So they stifled us, and we didn't play the Marco Silva way in that first half. But that's why we're very very conservative, a lot of sideways passing. You saw Marco Silva throwing his toys out of the pram, telling yeah. to full in place, come on, move forward, move forward. I could see him swearing and frustrating on the touchline because Villa were playing with such, you know, basically backfires. Back, you know, literally they had t- eleven men in their pit in their own half at times. We just lacked creativity, movement, and urgency, and couldn't press them because they always had one or two key players on our, our on the likes of Paulinho, on Mooney's. We just didn't have any space there whatsoever, and that's why I think I think that's a, that stemmed from Robinson not knowing who to throw the ball to. And made a mistake. And I think a lot of it, that's partly a factor. It was careless, but it was also a factor of the tactics that Villa played and that we, they capitalised on a mistake. That's very interesting, Emilio. And uh, I go often now to a Twitter account called Cottage Tactico. And this is one of the tweets from Cottage Tactico talking about the first half that Fulham did not press. Mm. And it probably, like you said, Emilio, came down to the tactics of Aston Villa. That's very interesting that you said that. And then you saw a complete change in the second half. So obviously Marco got to the team at halftime and showed them what they were doing wrong. And obviously they started to press in the second half and create more. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they didn't in the first half. They played more conservative, and I think it came back to bite them. But I think you have to give credit to uh, Aston Villa for their tactics. Your thoughts, uh, Max, on that? I agree. I think they, the, the work rate was better from Villa. They're also, I think, a better side than us. I mean, we need to acknowledge that. You know, there's, there's a reason they were in the title hunt for the first hmm. four to five months of the season. This is a very talented team. Emery sets them up well. And yeah, they, they knew what to do to put us in trouble. And I think when you, and we didn't really have solidity in the middle of the park. We kind of felt we were getting overran. And every time Bailey went forward and Watkins, I mean, these are really quality players. And I think we backed off and were t- was timid. Mm. That being said, I think Emilio made this point earlier. The second half, we were very positive, and we made that team who I just praised look average. I think that's what I want to talk about more is that, mm. you know, yes, the first half was poor, but, I mean, from 2-0 down, we had a very good reaction. And right. I think that's maybe why I want to leave this match more optimistic than just, you know, talking about the ref, et cetera, because we gave them a scare. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the second half. And before we talk about the response, and I'm glad that you've mentioned that, Max, because uh, there was a huge response being down two. Now, I would say there was even a response before that, even though they gave up the second goal, that the mindset was probably different coming from Marco Silva to the players at halftime. So, Emilio, the second goal from Aston Villa, just a poor mm-hmm. goal to give up. This mm-hmm. is just he, basically wide open for Ollie Watkins. They made it yeah. very easy on him. Your thoughts on Aston Villa's second goal? And then we'll talk about the response from Fulham after that. Yeah, again, Diop pressed up a little bit, got caught out. It's very simple. Watkins had the better of him throughout the game yesterday. I think Watkins was always sniffing on his shoulder, wasn't he? I think I just felt that Watkins was always waiting and praying for that for that moment of error and madness from our full defence. But we know our defenders, you said at the beginning of the show, Max, you know, the, they're not our two best defenders this season, but, you know, they're likely to make one or two mistakes throughout each game. And some some teams capitalised, and that Villa did. Bournemouth didn't do that last week. You know, there was a couple of moments against Bournemouth where we got away with it. You know, from open play. But Villa are more clinical. They've got they've got a lot of pace in this team, and they are well drilled. Emery's got them playing to a certain system. Confidence, quick. You know, we we struggled to contain with them at times. But I think that second half performance, come back from a two nil deficit, went to game. We've all said pretty much game over. But look, we responded fairly quickly. From a, from a sloppy Diop uh, defensive error. And on another day, with a bit more composure, with a bit more finesse where it counts, we would have got a point yesterday at least. We would have got a two-all draw, you know. you know. Uh, but, you know, there was always going to be a moment, wasn't there, before the end of the 90 minutes. And I think that moment was Adama Traore, who looked dangerous when he came on. Now, we know he's not the finished article. If he was a finished article, 
you know, he wouldn't have been a free a free agent in our son. There's a reason why he's where he is. But he spits Marco Silva's style of football. And there's a lot of excitement because he's a bit like Abubakar Kamara, unpredictable, <laughs> can do the very the very th- very good things bad and vice versa. But with a bit more composure, maybe a bit more quality finishing, we should have got a, a deserved equaliser yesterday. And that maybe would have, yes, would have criticised the referee, but it would be less of a problem. That just, just, but overall, I like the response. I, I was quite clear yesterday. I think we'd, we didn't deserve to lose, and I didn't think Villa looked like a top four team, you know, throughout the game. They're capitalised on those two mistakes. Right. You know, and that's it. And there was a VR decision. I haven't seen the VAR, their decision, one that got disallowed. It must have been very close because the referee... It was. Final, you know, the Fulham one, I think, was a little bit more clear-cut with Paulinho being offside. But, you know, I thought they got their one because it was taking so long for a decision to be made. I had a feeling Villa were going to get that goal. It was very I, close. I, I never saw it. It must have been quite close. Yeah, it was very extremely close. So... If you're an Aston Villa supporter, you might be very upset about that because it was very close. But okay. over to you, Max. I want to give you uh, the chance to talk about the goal because, again, this is, as you said, this might be, in your opinion, could be up for goal of the season. So your thoughts on Rodrigo Muniz here? I just think the angle is incredibly tight. And you can only get one type of connection on this ball, and it's a flick with the outside of your right boot, and he did it mm-hmm. perfectly. And just made Martinez look like a fool. And it's a great run. Because I think Robinson under hits it a bit. He's asking him to do a lot with that ball. Uh, but Muniz hit it perfectly. And it really jolted us into, into the match. Because after this, it's all full. Yeah. Um, mm. And then I was just delighted for Muniz again. Uh, I thought it was very well with taking goal. Very satisfying. Okay. So, Max, in your mind, when we get the goal, were you thinking we have a really good chance to get a point out of this? I thought so. I mean, we're at the cottage, half an hour left. Goals change matches. We know that. And we seem to be having all the momentum. And that's what was key, is that Villa weren't the dangerous threat we saw them being. And yes, they had the counter, but I thought Awobi coming on was so crucial. Yeah. Okay. I, love, I mean, he's he's such a quality player. Don't okay. understand the stick he got from the Nigeria fans. I didn't see the matches, but he's just always making things happen. I thought Wilson was good as well. Wilson was good, um, yeah. Wilson's just just good. a lot of talent off the bench. Bassey was striding forward. It felt like we had we had the juice, but we just couldn't get mm, the final mm. goal. Okay. Emilio, your thoughts on the substitutions? I forgot to mention that Alex Awobi came on to start the second half, which I think is huge, okay? Because I think Fulmer are a better side when he is in there. Mm. And uh, your thoughts on all of the substitutions? You've mentioned Adama Traore almost scoring the equalizer, mm-hmm. but there are some other good performances, Harry Wilson, too. So your thoughts? Yeah, I think I didn't realize until after the game that um, Williams had an injury. Seems like he pulled a hamstring. That's what that is, as some of the fans were saying. He was, he was holding the back of his uh, leg. So clearly, he's probably he did have the best of halves, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, I think it was an enforced change. If William was more on it, I don't think Iwobi would have started to come on straight on at half time, in my opinion. But Iwobi coming on gave us more energy. More you know, Obviously, he's more direct, you know, looking to make things happen, like Max says. I thought Wilson came on, looked always very, very lively. I think, you know, don't be surprised. He'll probably start next week. It'd be interesting to see with a pretty much a full-strength squad, who does Marco Silva play against Man United next week? Because, you know, you've got Wilson's back from injury quicker than we expected. He came right. on as a sub against Bournemouth and looked lively yesterday. Wobie's back from a big tournament. He's going to obviously start next week. Uh, you'd probably expect, was it Pereira and Bobby Reid to be dropping to the bench? But then... We've got a stronger bench. That's when's the last time we've had a bench of this strong? You're, you know, two central defenders who potentially are regular starters on the bench. Right. We had Iwobi on the bench, Traore on the bench. We've got uh, Iwobi on this bench. So literally, we had a very strong squad. You know, Harrison Reeves on the bench. So look, we've, we're blessed with a bit of depth on that bench yesterday. And but the substitutes has made a difference. But it's just that a bit of composure, a bit of quality. Like I said, if we had an Ollie Watkins type of player on the pitch, we probably would have scored an equaliser. The fact that we had a Dama Traore, who looked lively, looked quick, tried to make things happen. But in that moment of composure, you need more quality. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to capitalise on that. But, you know, look, I don't think the performance is as bad as warranted on social media. When I'm seeing all the criticism on social media, I actually think there was the, the game was closer than people were suggesting. It was all because all of the referee, but actually on the pitch over the 90 minutes, wasn't much between the two teams. Okay, that. excellent stuff. All right, guys, to end the show, let's go to man of the match. And uh, if you're watching live, feel free to share who was your man of the match. 
Emilio, you're man of the match. I'll be honest with you. I struggled to, to, you know, I thought I'd give it marginally to Muniz only because he scored the goal and that pass to Traore that could have got us a point. But overall, who else? I thought Pally had a good second half. The only reason why I was reluctant to give it to him is that stupid foul for that yellow card. If it wasn't for that yellow card, Paulinho may have got me, might have marginally got me the yellow card. Uh, sorry, the man of the match for me yesterday. Okay. Because I thought he had a great second half. He really captained that team second half. And that's another thing as well. I think we haven't called this out. And I've, I know Chris Davidson's probably not watching here, but what we're missing is a captain on the pitch. Tom Kearney's playing well this season. When the chips are down, when that last 10 minutes, you need a captain there to, to steady the ship, control and compose that team. Tim Rim is a better captain than Tom Kearney. I, in my opinion, Tom Kearney was on that pitch when the chips were down that last 10 minutes. I didn't see Tom captaining the team and stopping those needless fouls and rallying the trips. I'm always a one looks at body language and I observe a lot. I don't talk. I like to watch on the pitch. Tim Rim's a better captain, goes to the players, has little chats in people's ear. That's what we missed yesterday. When we're, when okay. we're goal behind, you need a leader. I love Tom Kearney. Don't get me wrong. I don't think he's a captain. I've said this many, many times in the past. You need a, your captain to lead. Take away, Don't get sucked into those tactics from Aston Villa. I didn't see enough of that yesterday. And I think if we had a stronger captain on the pitch, we would have actually said, you know what, Villa, sod off. We're not going to We're not going to get sucked into your tactics. We're going to rise above it. It's like we did in that second half when we scored that goal. I think we need to see more leadership on the pitch when it can. At times, we're lacking a true captain. Criticise me if you want, people, but I just don't think Tom Kenny in the moments of need, he's the captain that we need. He's a good player this season, but captain material, I've always been quite critical of that. And I think that's what we missed yesterday, in my opinion. That's so, in my opinion, Moniz gets the man of the match because of his goal. Okay. But I would have given it to Paulinho had he not made that stupid foul at the end. Okay. I always say this, Emilio. I, I miss Kevin McDonald for his leadership. <laughs> Danny yeah. Murphy, same thing. Yeah. You're talking two leaders on the pitch. And Fulham have missed out, I think, for a while without yeah. since those guys. You know, yeah. nothing against Tim Ream or Tom Kearney. They're just not that type of uh, captain. And uh, I think it's always good to have a captain like that. And mm. Unfortunately, Fulham don't have that. That's a good point by you. All right, Max, who was your man of the match? I'd go Maniz, too. I think Emilia said it perfectly. But in terms of the best player on the pitch, it was Ollie Watkins. Okay. Without a, with, 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 and that's the difference in this match is he's – Absolute quality. You know, Fulham don't have a player like that. Okay, very good. All right. And just want to mention as we're en ending this show, the match now is two to one as Ludentown have scored a goal. So it's mm -hmm. it's two to one. So uh very interesting. And uh but Manchester United uh are up next, guys, and that will be a difficult match. Okay, guys, to end the show, just give me your final thoughts over to you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you so much for doing this. I miss doing shows with you, and of course. Milio Giannis, I know, wanted to do a show, but um, unfortunately he could not join us today. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, no, great to be on. It's always the best part to recap the full match with knowledgeable <laughs> fellows like yourself, so glad to be on. Um, I think I'm worried a bit, not to be all doom and gloom, but our, our next five matches are none of them mm. are easy. None. I think the one you could look at is Sheffield United of the way, but they're fighting for their lives. And we saw what they did to Luton Town the other week. So I think it's, so it's Spurs, Sheffield United, Brighton, and Man U. So and I, listen, and Wolves as well, and Wolves, and Wolves, who might be the most on-form team in the league right now. So I just hope we can see some players step up. I'm not concerned about being dragged back in because there are a lot of teams between us and the drop and a lot of points. But th this is a type of this is a time of the season when players can really show what they're made of, and I'm hoping for some big performances uh, because we need that against quality sides. Okay. Final thoughts from you, Emilio, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, always good to do a show with Matt. It's been a long time so that we've not done a show together. Um, but overall, look, I don't think we should be too despondent. I actually thought we matched Villa for the best part of 90 minutes on the on whole. There'll be picks and troughs when they, like I said, the difference was Ollie Watkins, like uh, like Max said, he capitalised on the errors and, and was clinical. But overall, we, we gave them something to think about and we made them worried. And that's why they kept time wasting further more gamesmanship lack of gamesmanship throughout the game and uh we look we've got some tough games coming up man united we haven't been i'm not going to tempt faded we haven't been 
rolled over by them for some time. We've always close matches the last couple of seasons. Again, that gap is closing. So there's hope that we can get something out of the game next week and compete. I think Brighton, I, I keep saying this, how did Brighton find a way to keep winning? I don't know. Maybe I'm being, I'm being disrespectful to them, but on paper, our, our squad looks better, more experienced and better quality than theirs, but they find a way of keep being more consistent than Fulham. So I think that Brighton game is probably the best chance to get three points in the next four. Wolves away is going to be tough, but we've got to, you know, I think we can get something out of that game. And Tottenham, you know, they're very inconsistent as well. So yeah, it's tough four games, but we shouldn't be we shouldn't be fearing anybody. You know, they're not they're not Liverpool, they're not Arsenal, they're not uh, Manchester City. Their teams sort of a fringe of the the red, you know, the European spots. We can we can meet these teams. Yeah, no disrespect. We're we're Fulham. We're mid table. These teams are just a few places above us. So nothing to fear. I think we've got more to look forward to, and we've got hopefully Williams can recover from his injury. It's nothing too serious there. But overall, we we should have a fairly good score. Even without Palina, we should be able to fight and and make Man United and Brighton the next couple of games sweat for their for for the, those two games. Okay. That's what I like about Emilio, some positivity. There we go. To end the show, I got Emilio giving me some positive vibes, and I like that. Okay. Well, thank you, both of you, for doing the show with me. But let's wrap this up. For Emilio Donella and Max Cohen, I'm Russ Coleman. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening to Cars Talk, part of the TalkSport Fan Network.